Ichigo Kurosaki represents one third of the template that battle shonen protagonists follow to this day. His position as the protagonist in one of the big three grants him almost legendary status. However, unlike the continuing appearances of Luffy and Naruto, Ichigo had almost fallen to the wayside after the anime was cancelled. That was until Bleach Thousand Year Blood War was announced to be airing in the fall 2022 season. After a decade long hiatus, what's a better way to get back into the world of Bleach than exploring its protagonist? Today, we'll be doing a deep dive into Ichigo Kurosaki, from his powers and potential to what we can expect to see from him in Thousand Year Blood War. Base Stats even before starting his Soul Reaper training, Ichigo was a much more capable fighter than the average 15-year-old. He had been training in martial arts for nearly a decade, which unsurprisingly translates really well to fighting as a Shinigami. His father, Ishin Kurosaki, was more than happy to continue extreme hand-to-hand -hand combat training at home. Because of this consistent regimen, Ichigo started his training leaps and bounds ahead of other Shinigami. As a result, his strength is off the charts. He can smash a full grown man's head through a sidewalk with ease. Ichigo's extensive martial arts training also aids in his enhanced speed and reflexes. He's able to strike opponents in quick succession while simultaneously dodging attacks. And if he does get hit, be it from another martial artist or a supernatural being, Ichigo can recover incredibly quickly and jump back into the fight. I'll be getting into the details of Ichigo's battle prowess in a little bit, but the key takeaway is that he is incredibly strong, beyond what any novice Shinigami normally is. Obviously, physical prowess isn't the only factor that makes a powerful Shinigami. Strategy, knowledge, and spiritual connection are also incredibly important. Luckily for Ichigo, he excels in these categories as well. Ichigo is genuinely an intelligent guy in both an academic and strategic sense. He's one of the top 25 students in his high school and is able to maintain this position after becoming a substitute Shinigami. His academic intelligence leads into his stellar deductive skills. He can study his opponent's fighting style and immediately pick apart what their strengths and weaknesses are. But what really makes Ichigo a natural Shinigami is his connection to the spirit realm. Again, he's been able to see ghosts for as long as he can remember, so his synchronicity with spirits is already established. Since he's been so in tune with the spirit realm from such a young age, he bypassed the learning curves that many substitute Shinigami have by default. Ichigo can sense spiritual energy from otherwise impossible distances, even as it weakens or dissipates. This ability also translates well into battle because he can sense enemies retreating via their energy signatures. Combined with his ability to easily pick up new battle techniques, he is also able to weaponize his spiritual energy much more quickly. Perhaps the best example is his use of the spirit ribbon, mere days after picking up duties as a substitute Shinigami. So, with a solid baseline of how strong Ichigo naturally is, I think we can finally get into the finer points of Ichigo's Soul Reaper career. From kids see ghosts to kid fight ghosts. Ichigo starts as a high school student who can see and communicate with ghosts. He lives a pretty regular life with his single father Ishin and his two little sisters, Karin and Yuzu, before, in now typical shonen fashion, a mysterious figure and a monster show up and change the trajectory of his life forever. The mysterious figure in this case is Rukia Kuchiki, a Shinigami on the hunt for a malevolent spirit called a hollow in the area. After Ichigo kicks her to the ground, a reasonable response for someone breaking into his room, she binds him with a Kido spell, rendering him immobile. After seeing his two little sisters hurt by the spirit, Ichigo is able to release himself from the binding spell through sheer willpower alone. Turns out, the hollow is tracking him since his soul and spiritual energy are incredibly powerful. This, plus a severe injury, convinces Rukia to bestow some of her Shinigami powers to Ichigo so he can save his family. Unfortunately for her, the transfer is botched and Ichigo ends up taking nearly all of her power, thus making him a Shinigami. Shinigami. The first fight I'd consider pivotal to explaining both Ichigo's powers and characterization is against the Menos Grande. 
It's not his first fight since accidentally inheriting the powers of a Soul Reaper. He's fought a few smaller hollows and managed to defeat them on pure instinct alone, since he's barely learned how to properly wield his Zanpak Toe. None of the monsters he'd fought until then held a candle to the Menos Grande. This hollow is actually composed of two separate beasts that can fight separately from one another. It's essentially two massive malignant spirits in one. Luckily, Ichigo had a pseudo ally in his classmate Uryu Ishida, a member of the rival spiritual faction known as the Quincy. Uryu is actually the one responsible for bringing out the Menos Grande because he summoned dozens of smaller hollows for the two to battle to prove that Quincy's are the strongest fighters. After the Menos Grande enters through the Kumon Gateway, all the smaller hollows that Uryu summon to battle start to disperse, and they pray to the much larger spirit before being consumed. While the two are from polar opposite groups that have been warring for years, Uryu reluctantly teams up with Ichigo to defeat the beast. The substitute Shinigami makes the first move and slashes the Menos Grande's ankle, but he simply gets kicked away. Uryu criticizes Ichigo's methods, though his helig fail also does minimal damage. The two bicker for a bit before deciding to work together in earnest. Uryu discovers that holding Ichigo's Zanpak Toe allows access to the flow of his spiritual energy or Reiryoku. Since he's constantly leaking out Reiryoku at maximum output, Uryu tapping into it is absolutely no problem, and his own Reishi is strengthened tenfold. But I bet you're wondering why I'm calling this a pivotal battle for Ichigo since Uryu's been carrying it until this point. Well, first, this is where Ichigo discovers that his instinct to constantly have his Reiryoku on full blast is a benefit when he's battling with others. Second, it turns out that Uryu's plan was completely useless as Ichigo charges the Menos Grande to finish the Malevolent Spirit off himself. While it does launch a Seto Blast to counterattack, Ichigo is able to accumulate energy from Uryu to launch himself into the sky and bisects the Menos Grande. It gets sent back to Hueco Mundo, the world of the spirits, and Ichigo is now on the Soul Society's watch list. Another set of important battles in Ichigo's early Shinigami career were against Renji Abarai and Byakuya Kuchiki, the lieutenant and leader of the 6th division of Gotei 13. The three first meet mere minutes after Ichigo defeats the Menos Grande I just talked about. Rukia did not lie, Soul Society moves fast, and in this case, it's because she's on their hit list. Giving your Shinigami powers to some random guy is quite frowned upon, so Renji and Byakuya must bring her back to Soul Society and strip Ichigo of his Shinigami powers. The first fight between the three is a decisive loss for Ichigo, though he definitely puts up a strong showing. Uh, he's mostly on the defensive end of the battle for the first time since getting his powers, and his inexperience definitely shows through when fighting two military-trained powerhouses. But to his credit, he does land a few good hits before being stripped of his substitute Shinigami status. Now, Ichigo does get his powers back, this time, and eventually has one-on-one -on -one rematches with both. These fights are impressive in context for two reasons. First, since both rematches happened only a short time from their first fight, Ichigo was only able to hone his skills with Zanpak Toe for a few months. Second, as I said before, Renji and Byakuya are both high-ranking military officials in Soul Society and are some of the top-tier fighters introduced thus far. Through sheer will and instinct alone, Ichigo is able to defeat both almost back-to-back, -back, even after being launched through a building during his first fight with Renji. And while neither of those fights is a landslide victory for Ichigo, they are very important narrative points for his growth as a character. From a technical standpoint, this is where Ichigo's Hollow Mask makes its first appearance. Definitely not its last though. On the side of world building, the politics of Soul Society start to get introduced as well. Ichigo's newfound place within the association shapes his worldview later in the series. Byakuya, and especially Renji, get redemption arcs of their own, and realize that Ichigo's inclusion in Soul Society is not the detriment they thought it would be. By the end of the arc, he's officially a substitute Shinigami. 
Ichigo can easily turn enemies into allies, not just through violence, but by exploring and empathizing with different perspectives. This is something other mangaka inspired by Tite Kubo would incorporate into their own series. But before we go any further, be sure to subscribe to the channel with notifications on to never miss an upload, and smash that like button for some plot armor today. Ichigo versus his haters. The Hueco Mundo arc is truly where Ichigo begins to come into his own as a Shinigami. At this point, Ishin Kurosaki's past as a former member of the Shiba clan and the former captain of the 10th Division is brought to light. Now, Ichigo is officially Bleach's nepotism baby, and his easy slide into the world of Shinigami makes sense. It also has the battle saga that Bleach is most known for, Ichigo versus everyone's first villain crush, Grimjaw Jagajak. I'd honestly argue these three fights are what really cement Ichigo as a powerful Shinigami, even compared to the latter parts of the Aizen arc. We'll be discussing those a bit later though. I also think these battles are amazing benchmarks for watching how Ichigo has grown throughout the Arankar invasion arc, which is easily one of the densest arcs in the series. The first meeting between Grimjaw and Ichigo happens right after the start of the Cold War, a proxy war between Gote 13 and the disgraced former captain of the 5th Division, Sosuke Aizen. Aizen sent the Espada, who are a band of 10 hollows that removed their masks and gained Shinigami-like powers as a result. Ichigo is basically up against an already strong hollow, made even more powerful by Aizen's modifications. It's easily his most difficult opponent thus far. The resulting fight is almost like an intricate dance, with each fighter weaving around each other, blocking attacks, and landing semi-critical hits. Grimjaw's bare hands do cause a lot of destruction to Ichigo's body, especially when he goes full Dio Brando on Ichigo's face. The substitute Shinigami surprisingly lands a pretty critical blow. A black Getsuga Tensho blast that creates a large gash spanning most of Grimjaw's torso. Even still, the Espada continues to fight and nearly overpowers Ichigo. It genuinely seems like Ichigo might take a loss, until one of Aizen's men, the former captain of the 9th Division, Kaname Tosin, steps in to end the battle prematurely. Without his intervention, the struggle could have easily escalated to deadly levels. Ichigo and Grimjaw don't have to wait long before an opportunity for a rematch arises. The two enter the fight ready to finish what they started. Grimjaw proudly sports the permanent scar from the last fight to match that trademark hole the Arankar all share. Ichigo's been training his hollow abilities since his last altercation with the Espada. The two are on much more even ground in the second round. At first, it seems like the substitute Shinigami has the upper hand with a point-blank Getsuga Tensho. It seems his training with the Visards paid off. That is, until he maxes out on using the mask after 11 seconds. His stacked powers start to wane as the mask begins to crumble off his face. Grimjaw, seeing an easy advantage, turns the tides by breaking his opponent's hollow mask, ensuring he won't be able to use it for the rest of the fight, before pinning him to the ground with his sword. I've yet to really touch on Ichigo's holofication, mostly because it's been a secondary part of the plot compared to the ongoing war between Soul Society and Aizen. However, his holofication is a massive part of his character development from here to Thousand Year Blood War. The constant threat of White Ichigo taking control haunts him. But the combined powers of the Hollow and Shinigami grant him a strong battle advantage. But his first outing with intent to use the mask is another important mark in his growth as a Shinigami. During his rematch with Byakuya, the mask was a last-ditch effort and an introduction to Ichigo's hollow side that he wasn't even 100% sure about. He doesn't really get to use it much here since his attempts to resummon it are thwarted by his Reiryoku being completely expended. With no spiritual energy left to use, he is entirely at Grimjaw's mercy. He would have been a goner if Rukia and 5th Division Captain Shinji Hirako hadn't stepped in and brought the battle to a tie. So, 
With two battles ending in admittedly anticlimactic ties, Ichigo and Grimjaw's final fight had a lot of hype and emotions behind it. And wow, did it all pay off! This is where Ichigo's prowess as a defensive fighter gets its best showcase in the entire Hueco Mundo arc, demonstrating just how much he's grown since his first battle with Grimjaw. At first, this seems like the end of Ichigo. He's already on the brink of death from fighting the fourth Espada, Ukiora Cypher, who serves as a solid tertiary antagonist with his cold and ruthless battle methods. The requisite love interest, Orihime Inoue, dragged to Las Noches against her will, is only able to partially heal him before Grimjaw's bloodlust gets too high. Luckily, Ichigo is healed enough to nullify a potentially deadly Cero Blast with one of his Getsuga Tensho multiple times. The Espada seems genuinely upset at Ichigo avoiding killing him, but isn't aware of what Ichigo's capable of doing when the lives of his loved ones are on the line. From the dust of the second blast collision, the substitute Shinigami appears with the hollow mask on and death in his eyes. The mask and Ichigo's body manage to hold up through a series of particularly hard body slams and hits, and even when it begins to crack, he thinks quickly and replaces the mask near immediately. To counter Ichigo's increased strength, speed, and radioku, Grimjaw partially reverts to his panther-like hollow form and goes completely feral. This barely phases his opponent as he survives five of Grimjaw's incredibly destructive Gara de la Pantera. He's even able to block the finishing fatal move, Descaron, before ending the battle by shattering one of its talents and impaling Grimjaw on his own Zanpakuto. The epic battle saga is over, and Ichigo emerges victorious, motivated to kill to keep his closest friends safe. But the biggest and baddest battle of all is Ichigo's venture against Sosuke Aizen. The disgraced Aizen has been built up as the worst villain in the entire series for years now. He even has an entire arc named after him. Again, Ichigo's physical prowess really shines through here, especially after Aizen discovers that the young Shinigami has converted his Reiatsu into the spiritual equivalent of performance enhancers. The villainous man knows exactly what spiritual power enhancers can do. He literally invented one for himself to surpass both Shinigami and Hollow capabilities, so long as he has the will to fight. Aizen first tries to break his opponent's spirit before resorting to physical engagement. Obviously, as I've emphasized throughout this video, Ichigo's will is indomitable, so this does literally nothing. He's also able to block his opponent's first attack with his bare hands. An amazing feat considering Aizen was a Soul Society military powerhouse before defecting. The epic score rages in the background as the two slash at each other, destroying the landscape in the process. Ichigo's upper hand is quickly taken away when Aizen busts out the Hado number 90, Kudo Hitsugi, and nearly crushes him. But his above average durability saves him. Back on the defense, Ichigo continues to survive multiple potentially fatal attacks from his increasingly agitated opponent. This includes a blast that shakes the nearby Karakura town and sends him barreling into a crater. Incensed by his human arrogance and breaking the barriers between human and Shinigami, Aizen attempts to strip the teen of his powers. Ichigo's one step ahead of him though and charges up his final move. Saigo no Getsuga Tensho. This technique completely eradicates all of Ichigo's powers once he uses it, but its sheer power 
forces Aizen to not sustain his evolved form and make him easier to capture. As black flames rise around his body and his hair shifts to long and black, Ichigo successfully embodies Getsuga and sucks Aizen into the darkness of his Mugetsu. With the Hogyoku broken, the big bad is forced to revert back to his base state. Ichigo's powers finally run out and he falls back to earth. A delusional Aizen believes that the Hogyoku has fused with him, but his attempt to power back up fails so horribly that he's forced to reconcile with his ego. Ichigo reaches powers beyond even the biggest villain in the series and even manages to seal Aizen away before his body gives out. Even for a strong warrior like Ichigo, the ease of Aizen's imprisonment is still quite out of character. As Kisuke Urahara explains, there's a chance that the Hogyoku did not reject him. Ichigo surmises this might be because of a latent wish to become a normal Shinigami again. The evidence for this is flimsy at best, but it does highlight a naive optimism our protagonist still manages to cling on to. Obviously, this final boss battle was going to show everything Ichigo has to offer, both physically and spiritually. But it also shows that his motives and heart are still in the same place. He's willing to give up everything that benefits him in order to defeat the most dangerous threat to his friends. Full Bringer Alchemist Before I get into the Thousand Year Blood War arc and what could affect its success, I should probably recap where the manga left off. The Lost Substitute Shinigami arc starts with a powerless Ichigo returning to his life as a normal high school student, but something still nags at him to return. A run-in with some thugs starts to jog Ichigo's lost memories of his time within the Shinigami ranks. One of them, Kugo, wants information about his father, which is one thing he's able to provide. What he can't provide is where his father is, since his father still has his Shinigami powers and he does not. The two agree to meet later with Yasutora Sato and Kugo reveals that he's going to give Ichigo his Shinigami powers back. This will be done through transfer with a full bringer, someone born of a parent attacked by a hollow who can only pass down powers to the offspring of a human and Shinigami. Ichigo doesn't trust Kugo as far as he can throw him, but Sato has been an ally from the beginning. So, tired of not being able to protect his friends anymore and aware of the mutual benefits, he agrees to take on the full bring. After receiving the full bring, He's put through a retraining arc in Riruka Dokugamine's dollhouse. He's able to defeat the Yakuza stuffed animals by remembering how Sado and Kugo were able to access their own powers. He's returned to normal size only to find out Orihime's been kidnapped, a possible threat for him to stop training. Despite the new terror of potentially losing his closest friend, he continues on through the execution warehouse where his training continues. By the time our big bad for this arc, Shukuru Tsukushima, appears at the warehouse, Ichigo's got enough of a grasp on his full bring to utilize it like his old Shinigami techniques. Their fight is cut short by Kugo and Sado, who want their trainee to preserve his body instead of working off a now useless instinct. Tsukishima leaves and Ichigo's training arc moves to Sword Art Online territory as he's uploaded with Kugo into a console. Orihime is safe and brought to the warehouse where she protests the lack of ethics in this training. She's right to worry as Kugo taunts him and blinds him with his sword. Kugo uses Ichigo's distrust to push his full bring to being complete. It works and the training mini arc is over. Finally, Ichigo is ready to fight Tsukishima. However, Ichigo's distrust of Kugo was well founded as he was metaphorically stabbed in the back and physically stabbed in the chest. It turns out he was the mastermind all along. He was responsible for putting Uryu in the hospital and facilitated execution staging of Orihime's kidnapping. He holds Ichigo's full bring over his head so he complies and does not fight him. The newly realigned Tsukishima and Kugo leave Ichigo confused and alone until Rukia appears and stabs Ichigo in the back. Uh, physically this time. 
This stab was actually a net positive for him though, since it restores his Shinigami powers in the same manner that Rukia's sword had at the beginning of the series. With his powers restored, Ichigo is ready to hunt and defeat Kugo and the rest of Execution. Rukia, Orihime, and a healed Uryu cheer him on as he plows through the Fullbringers with ease before killing Kugo in his Bankai pocket dimension. The rest of Execution are either comatose or smart enough to scatter. Through his most intensive training and several acts of betrayal, Ichigo is back to his incredibly powerful Shinigami state. So, what now? As we said at the start of the video, Bleach is one of the big three that revolutionized shonen battle manga. Ichigo is one of the protagonists that created the standard for what a shonen MC should be. However, Ichigo's been out of the spotlight for about a decade. Shonen has grown and evolved in the decade since he last appeared on our screens, and the Thousand Year Blood War could make or break how fans view the legacy of Bleach. There are two things that this arc needs to do to redeem the anime, stick to the manga, and appeal to both new and older shonen fans. Perhaps the most infamous issue with the Bleach anime adaptation is that it diverged so much from the manga. It wasn't the first time that a manga or an anime went on completely different paths. Soul Eater did it a few years prior, but it was probably one of the most infamous. Bleach didn't change the ending much, mostly because of its cancellation, but it did add non-canonical arcs that added little to the story. Nowadays, longer anime-only arcs are mostly saved for films like One Piece Red. They serve as little treats for the superfans. While Bleach also has a few anime-only films, the additional non-canonical arcs just add too much material to an already dense series. Adding filler arcs to the anime definitely helped Ichigo seem even stronger, but it also took away from explaining the intricacies of larger canonical arcs like Arankar. These mini arcs did little to advance the actual plot or explain any of the larger forces that Ichigo had to defeat. Ideally, this new season will forego references to the anime-only arcs in favor of sticking to the established manga, which is already exciting enough. The Thousand Year Blood War serves as a pivotal point for the Bleach franchise, not just because it's the first televised adaptation in a decade, but because its original fanbase has grown up. Bleach was a lot of people's first introduction to shonen battle manga, and now, in the era where that same genre dominates the global anime scene, its original fans are now used to the tropes that Bleach helped set up. This new adaptation can't just coast on nostalgia alone, it has to add to the newer trends in shonen anime. Out of all the arcs in the manga, this one is definitely the best suited for the darker tone set by Bleach's contemporaries. It also has the potential to benefit from a decreased focus on censoring blood and gore like the original series did. Kubo himself said that many of the rushed battles in this arc of the manga will get expanded upon thanks to the four cores this arc will take up. But most importantly, this is the arc that wraps up the long-standing rivalries and mysteries that the original series left on a cliffhanger. Will the genocidal war between the Quincy and Shinigami end? How far does Ichigo's hollowification go? And why exactly is Aizen like… that? I do think that Thousand Year Blood Wars plot combined with smoother, updated animation and its darker tone bodes for a great adaptation. I'm genuinely excited to see how this epic final arc plays out on the screen. And that's the end of our deep dive into Ichigo and our hopes and predictions for the Thousand Year Blood War. Let us know about your feelings about the anime so far in the comments below, and what parts you're excited to see adapted. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Anthony Fan, and have an amazing rest of your day.